He's here, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell y'all what, Michelle Hall watches. I know she's listening right now, because she's at least watching the first five seconds, you know? No, she watches, she talks to me about it, I'm like, Michelle Hall, you know what? Hey, you must not have anything to do, but she's actually working. She has it going in the background, so I picked it up off the table. Yes, t-shirts are here for anybody who hasn't got one. Um, if you want one or multiple from this point on, get with uh, the riddles, and we'll get your order, and we'll make some more orders. And uh, I'm rotating. Oh, okay. Thank you. Morning, Kimber. Hey, front row tickets are still available. Just know that. You can't beat front row. Well, it's clickable. 
I know what you mean. That makes sense. Scott. Everybody knew it when I said get with Scott. They knew it was are, are you looking for feedback on the uh, of our class uh, given to? Good about it. Yes, I'm very good at giving the feedback. Uh, I, I looked at both of them, and I don't know. I, I prefer local versus. I'm, I guess I'm not a trusting kind of guy. Like I feel like if we give our money, we never we don't really know if it's going to the intended person or group or whatever it may be. But my, uh, so that's just my two cents is I prefer local, whether it's that one or we decide something else. But my question is, when are we gonna do that? Because we keep making announcement after announcement about this, but, so we're not really doing anything about it by I making like, announcements. I feel like that one day, somebody's just gonna hit them, they're gonna be like, Chris, you're leaning, somebody's gonna stab them, and be like, all right, I feel like it's today. You don't know. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't want to force us into no, something. Today, but I mean, you know, it's not well, you got to keep continuing to make announcements. I mean, we're not doing anything. I was going to say also, it's, I mean, if we wanted to make a donation to something, now our students at Uni Christian School are going to the Bahamas. We go every year. This is a mission trip, and um, they like. I would get pictures, everything, because it'd be on website and all that stuff. But uh, they're raising money to go to the Bahamas. They had a car wash yesterday, so um, to get them over there. So, so and it's we all. This, this is and so, so guys, this is <laughs> I, and this is the thing. This is actually students. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean they do have adults going to chaperone and everything, but the majority of them are students that are going on this mission. So they are the going out. So, and it's to not like where you see the Bahamas, where it's like, hey, straight. No, no, no. This is like one of the smaller islands. Uh, it's so I can't remember how to say it, um, but it's very, very cool and stuff. And we actually have a couple of kids from there that have gone to me. And two of them just graduated this year. So. And speaking of. Uh given monthly or to this, we're still taking up donations for our Sunday school class in order to do that if anybody wants to give. Excellent job. You guys get an opportunity today. You can pat him on the back. You did very good. Although this is didn't come. And, and Barak, he, um, he hesitates, and he says, only if you go with me. 
then they go and God gives them victory. Um, one cool note there is um, is, is mashak is the word that they use, and when when um, they call out the ten thousand warriors, you draw out or you muster is a is a fancier uh, English word. Uh, you muster them out, you rally the troops to yourself, and I will rally um, you know the enemy to you. Uh, mashak mashak used twice in the same verse there, verse seven. I like that. Um, and we, then we, we talked about how we see it on this large scale, and then we see it in, in this, which just like Ehud and, and Eglon, we see this much more private, intimate scene as well. We see the large scale picture, you know, Yahweh defeating Jabin, but then we also see these details um, where uh, the private encounter where he uses Jael, uh, the wife of Heber from the Kenites, who invites Sisera into her tent and murders. And she, she murders him violently, uh, very deceptively. The whole thing is completely premeditated, murder in the first degree. Um, but she's an assassin, and her and her actions are all very un-Jewish. Uh, that's, that's something you should take out of that. Um, all of everything she does is very un-Jewish. Um, Jael, she, she goes out to meet Cicero and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Uh, come in, don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and covered him again. And she's set in this trap, you know. Um, I think often we look at it in a, it's like a seductive kind of a role. She's like, hey, buddy, come on in, you know, that kind of thing. But but I'm going to I'm gonna throw out there, what if she's doing it more in a motherly way? Um, that's a different way of looking at it. But I've seen a lot of support for that. Um, when she sets her trap, she's, she's motherly. She covers him with this blanket. She gives him this milk to drink. And then she readjusts or, or recovers him with the blanket. There are these, she's taking care of them type of things in there um, that's associated with that. I kind of like that as well. Um, you can be kind of But she proudly shows off Rock's corpse, uh, or Derek's corpse, to um, uh, with the tent peg still in his head. Um, we, we, discussed, we discussed how she kind of one-shots him. You know, we were talking about Hunter. And his, uh, his carpenter skills, you know, he sets up the, he, he tech, tech, and then he just slams it all the way in. That's exactly what, what happened here. Uh, it's a one shot kind of a deal. Um, the, the verse says, and drove the tent, and drove the peg into his temple, and it went through into the ground. It is this follow through that is all the way in. It comes out both sides, and we're here today. And they ain't got nothing yet. And um, yep. but she <laughs> is an assassin, you know? <laughs> she is an um, <laughs> I mean, look at that. I'm, I'm laughing at you. I'm laughing at you saying. I wish, uh, I wish that Christy would have signed it, right? Because this is very good. Oh, very good. Yeah. This is the best face yeah. to this. I'm feeling a little proud this morning. That's really good. really good. I'm good. You see his tongue? That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just I'm, like, I'm a perfect piece. <laughs> but it's, it's, look at his little legs. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> this is a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> we need to find that. I mean, seriously, we need that on the wall. It's really good. It's really good. It's funny. All right. That's good. I start to say, that was good. Back to the violence. What is it? That's Lisa. She is. Oh, it is. It is. She is this assassin stuff. Um, in being this assassin, though, She's, she's a traitor to her husband. She's a traitor to all of her allies. She, um, and you only talk about what the Israelites think about her. What uh, does the author think about her? How, how are we told about her? Um, we talked about her character, how she's this traitor to the Canaanites. Um, she's in killing Sisera. She guarantees the victory for the Israelites. But she violates so many social customs. Uh, just being, uh, just supporting as a wife. Uh, the ancient Near Eastern hospitality rules, you're going to bring somebody in and you're going to kill them. Everything she goes against. Um, and for Barak, he's shamed by that. She fulfills his role. Um, she actually displays deep contempt for Sisera, for Javan, for Haber, her, her husband, and for Barak. Uh, from the author's perspective, she's an agent of deliverance. She fulfills the prophecy. God does uh, give Sisera into the hands of a woman, just like Deborah said. Uh, for the hands of a woman 
the Lord will deliver Sisera. So it kind of has this double meaning. Um, where, where Deborah can take credit, some credit for the overall victory, you know, especially in the eyes of, of the world. Um, Jael, whose hand actually finishes off Sisera. She's not a prophetess. She's not an Israelite. She never says, I follow God. We don't know anything about her religious views. Um, she's a Kenite who's the wife of an ally of the enemy. Um, her role is socially revolutionary. Um, I, I really like that. Jael is an assassin. So many times for us in the West, we we don't understand any other culture other than our own. You know, what we're surrounded by, which is, which is the case of other people as well, not just picking on us. But we have our own understanding of, of um, how society works and the role of a woman or the role of a man or the role of children and all these different things. Whereas in the Bible times, in ancient times, um, especially in the ancient Near East, it would have been just socially uh, a completely different construct. Um, it would have been everybody, not this independentness that we have now, you know. Um, if anybody hasn't started watching the show, I'm just going to give a little quick plug. Um, Tara and I are obsessed with the, the Shogun. Shogun is an A-plus masterpiece. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, but in Shogun, it's the story of this Englishman who comes to Japan, and he doesn't understand anything. He doesn't understand shame. He doesn't understand guilt. He doesn't understand any way they look at anything, you know? They would rather die with what they call honor than to live poorly, you know? And like for him, he would much rather live poorly. Hey, what are you talking about? But like we just, and, and it's this, these two worlds, they're thrown into the same world. It's, it's very good, a little plug there. But back to what we're talking about in the, in the Bible, it's the same thing. They have this shame and this guilt culture, um, that, that doesn't allow them to have these individual views. Everything's for the group. Nobody would make these kind of moves. These moves are very out of out of context, out of uh, or out of the norm for the time. Uh, for this woman <coughs> to do this, um, it's it's something. So then, chapter four ends with a summary statement, God's security statement. The author's focus is shifted from Sisera to King Jabin, and it says Yahweh gave victory over King Jabin. And the story was never about Sisera. It's never about Jael. Or Barak, um, it was about it was about God the entire time, and that's where we start today. We, we start in the victory of chapter four. Um, it is a it is a time for a celebration. It's a time for a song, um, and and so that's where we're going to be today. Uh, we'll open in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much, uh, so much for bringing us here this morning. We ask that you open our minds as we study your word and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Help us to see what you're revealing to us. We ask that you challenge and change it this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. So we are going to be in chapter 5, which is the Song of Deborah. Um, I'm not sure what page it is in our fancy books. Anybody on the right page? 60. 60. Debbie, man, she knows them. Um, but no, we uh, we have this victory song. Now, it's very common, especially in today's settings, what we would call this a poem. Um, this is definitely a song. Um, but sometimes because we can't sing it, especially in English, we have, we have a huge disconnect from this. Um, so hopefully I, I want to try to connect us to it today. So <clears throat> I'm going to sing it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm, just kidding. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to sing it. Um, but I do want you to pay attention to the elements and the structure of the song, how, how the lengths of the lines, uh, even in our English, it still kind of works. It's still You can still kind of see what we have going on in there. Um, there is no, there is no rhyming for us. Um, these lines don't rhyme for us, so we have, we have a disconnect there. Um, but it does. Uh, one of my favorite things when anything happens in the Bible, where it's a chiasm, where it, it follows this formula, it reaches the, the middle is the is the focus, and it works its way back out. Um, I love that. But it's broken up into stanzas or verses, just like any other song. Before. Um, it is a victory hymn, which in the ancient Near East at that time would have been very common. Um, Ancient Near Eastern victory hymns. Uh, one of the most popular. It's kind of hard to read that from there, but this is the uh, the, the Merneptha Stele, which is which is a huge song, and it, they wrote it down on this huge thing. You go to the next one, you can get an idea how big it is. It's a humongous song, but that is like um, the equivalent of uh, the uh, the worship team singing Jaira. <laughs> That's just a <laughs> worship team joke. Moving on. Um, but it's it's very similar uh, to all of these all these other known hymns at the time. 
Um, we're still at 1300 BC. So at the time, there are a lot of different known songs that, that people sing, and they're very much staged the same way as this song. Um, so it's been very common uh, in, in, you know, in the Old Testament to include victory hymns. One of our most popular that, we, that I, I want to read just a little bit out of, just to kind of set the tone, is the song of deliverance. Um, Moses and Miriam in Exodus 15, um, they, sing, they sing this song. Song of deliverance is the name of it. I'm going to read it, uh, just the first few verses. And then Moses and all the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has tri triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army he has hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters gush over them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow those who rise against you. You unleash your blazing fury. It consumes them like straw. So, kind of like we talked about um, last week, is when we have chapter 4, we have the prose. We have this story of what happened, um, you know, with, with these details being specific to some degree. <coughs> And then here, in chapter 5, we have this, this poetry. We have these beautiful words of, you know, uh, illusion and, and different things. Just in the one we just read, um, they sank to the bottom like a stone. You know, everything is this poetic, um, uh, beautiful way of telling the story. Um, you know, your right hand smashes the enemy, and the greatness of your majesty, uh, you unleash your blazing fury, it consumes them like straw. So you have this this, uh, this poeticness to it, you know, and, and that's that's the purpose of a song, you know, um, that they would they would remember this, they would they would sing this in victory of this uh, this huge trial. Um, before we, we read it, I, I do want to say um, it's good to keep the context in mind. You know, one of the first questions would be who wrote this song. I, I always like to look at each chapter of the Bible or each verse and say who wrote this. You know, if we um, and, and, and even more than that, why did we put it here? You know, why is it right here? We've got these stories. We've got you know Shamgar and Ehud, and here's this story of Barak and, and Deborah, and we're going to go to Gideon. But like, why do we have this song? We don't have a song on Shamgar. We don't have a, a song on the rest of them. It, it, it's stuck here for a specific reason. Um, if we look at the traditional, you know, uh, view, which I myself hold of who wrote the Book of Judges, is Samuel. Well, Samuel, sometime after this, you know, he's about 250 years after. Um, but this song would have been written at the time of the event. You know, um, I'll just let you know. You, you know, the, the Jewish traditional view is that Deborah writes the song, um, which is which is something. You know, uh, there's a lot of eyes in this song. We'll get into that. But um, it is something to keep in place. This song would have been passed down through oral tradition to the time of Samuel, and he records it here. Um, don't I? I, I don't even like the idea that he, you know, like he's the first one to write it down. It's been written down before. Um, it's, um, but he places it here for a specific reason. Um, some of the details and lyrics, I, I feel like you should pay special attention to, keeping that in mind. Hey, who wrote this? Um, there's so many amounts of eyes. Uh, I will this. I will that. Um, just like in Exodus 15, when we just read in, in Miriam's song, um, you know, I will this. I will that. Just like in First Samuel and Hannah's song. I will this, I will that, you do this, I will this. Very similar songs. They're, they're all very um, very similar, and they're all connected through women as well, which is uh, very neat. But if this is written by Deborah, this is her interpretation of the battle, poetic. Uh, this is a, it's a prophetic word. Um, everybody who, who dates the song, dates this, the song to the, you know, the time of Deborah, 1300, 1296, uh, it's, a, it's a fancier, um, more specific number. But this song is intended to educate. It's intended to inspire. It's intended to, you know, pass this on for, for generations. Um, I think it's entertaining. And it's very amusing. Uh, the whole story of it, I mean, I think you know, he gets his head taken the guy's head. head. It, it's very uh, shocking. You know, there's some, there's some stuff. And it celebrates God. It celebrates God and his 
awesomeness, his triumph. He's the real hero of the battle. He's the hero of not just these chapters, but the whole book. Um, so this section is to be enjoyed, not analyzed. I, th I think that's pretty fair. Uh, we're going to discuss some of the features afterwards, but we're not going to go into it kind of like we did in chapter four, um, just because this is more of a song. And, and I think that it's written more to be to be beautiful and, instead of dissected as chapter four. So uh, chapter five, the song of Deborah. <clears throat> Stay with me. It's a couple verses, but here we go. And on that day, Deborah and Barak, son of um, Abinoam, sang this song. Israel's leaders took charge, and the people gladly followed. Praise the Lord. Listen, you kings, pay attention, you mighty rulers, for I will sing to the Lord. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you set out from Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled, and the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord, the God of uh, Mount Sinai, in the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anna, and in the days of Jael, people avoided the main roads. Travelers stayed on the winding pathways. There were few people left in the villages of Israel until Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. When Israel chose new gods, war erupted at the city gates. Yet not a shield or spear could be seen among 40,000 warriors in Israel. My heart is with the commanders of Israel, who's, uh, with, with those who volunteered for war. Praise the Lord. Consider this, you who ride on fine donkeys, you who sit on fancy saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road. Listen to the village mus musicians gathered at the watering hole. They recount the righteous victories of the Lord and the victories of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord marched down to the city gates. Wake up, Deborah. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up and sing a song. Arise, Mary. Lead your captives away, son of Ab Abinoam. Down from Tabor marched the few against the nobles. The people of the Lord marched down against mighty warriors. They came down from a land that once belonged to the Amalekites. They followed you, Benjamin, with your troops. From Makir, the, the commanders marched down. From Zebulun came those who carry a commander's staff. The princes of this car were with Deborah and Barak. They followed Barak, rushing into the valley. But in the tribe of Reuben, there was great indecision. Why do you sit at home among the sheepfolds to hear the shepherds whistle for their Yes, in the tribe of Reuben, there was great indecision. Gilead remained east of the Jordan. And why did Dan stay home? Asher sat unmoved at the seashore, remaining in his harbors. But Zebulun risked his life, as did Naphtali, on the heights of the battlefield. The kings of Canaan, Canaan came and fought at Tanakh near Megiddo Springs, but they carried off no silver treasure. The stars fell from heaven. The stars in their orbits fought against Sicily. The Kishon River swept them away. That ancient, ancient torrent, the Kishon. March on with courage, my soul. Then the horses' hooves hammered the ground. The galloping, galloping of Sisera's mighty steeds. Let the people of Moroz be cursed, said the angel of the Lord. Let them be utterly cursed. Because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty warriors. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Eber the Kenite. May she be blessed above all women who live in tents. Sisera asked for water, she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him yogurt. Then with her left hand, she reached for a tent peg, and with her right hand, for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera with a hammer, crushing his head. With a shattering blow, she pierced his temples. He sank, he fell, he lay still at her feet. And where he sank, there he died. From the window, Sisera's mother looked out. Through the window, she watched for his return, saying, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why don't we hear the sound of chariot wheels? 
Her wise women answer, and she repeats these words to herself. They must be dividing the captured plunder with a woman or two for every man. There will be colorful robes for Cicero and colorful embroidered robes for me. Yes, the plunder will include colorful robes embroidered on both sides. Lord, may all your enemies die like Cicero, but may those who love you rise like the sun in all its power. Then there was peace in the land for 40 years. All right. <coughs> Amen. That's quite a long, uh, quite a long stretch there. I think it's like, um, it's like a minute. If you read out loud for a minute, most people have lost you right there at the minute and one. I can tell everybody's still focused in. But here you go. But uh, the, the structure of the song it is this nine verse, and, and here's an even fancier structure of the song where they break down the different stanzas and give them a, um, each one a little title. Um, for me, I, I find the most. You know, we we, we know the story to some degree. Are there, are there a little more details in this? You're like, oh, hold on, bowl of yogurt. <laughs> like we didn't mention that in the first one. But like there are there are some, you know a few little differences here and there, or not differences, but more specifics that were left out over here, uh, different things like that. But for me, one of the most interesting stanzas is um, is the waiting in vain for the prize. Uh, the, verses 28 through 30, very unique. Uh, it, it, in this type of song, it is it is um, normal. Um, the stanza eight, which says, from the window. Cicero's mother looked out. Through the window, she watched for his return, saying, Why is his chariot so long to <coughs> Why don't we hear the sound of his chariot wheels? And this is like, for me, just some old school trash talk. Like, this is like <laughs> trash talking 101. I love this. Um, Cicero's mom, she's standing at her window, waiting for his return, his triumphant return. She's going to be waiting for a while. You know, your poor mom, there she is at the window. She's just going to be there for a while. Um, but this this ancient uh, trash talk is it, it, common in victory hymns. You take a couple shots back at, at you know, the people that, that were fighting against you. Um, she looks through the window. She peered through the lattice, is another one, crying out, why is this chariot so long in the coming? Why don't I hear the hoofbeats of his horses? Um, I included a couple ivory carvings, which, which also depict people's moms waiting at the windows as their sons would be coming home, you know? These would have been drawn by their enemies, you know? Um, I really like it. It's, it's, it's provoking the enemy. It is uh, promoting yourself and your own victory. Um, man, you left your mom waiting on that one, you know? Uh, but you're singing about your enemy's mother. <laughs> it's, a, it's a low blow. But anyway, um, why, don't, why don't we hear the sound of this chariot wheel? Um, and then her wise women answer, and she repeats these words to herself. They must be dividing up the plunder, a woman or two for every man. Uh, there'll be colorful robes for sister, colorful embroidered robes for me. Yes, the plunder will include colorful robes embroidered on both sides. Uh, your mom's going to drive herself insane. She's just sitting there looking out her window for you. Uh, you're not going to make it back. Stand your nails for the tenth floor. You know? um, you're not making it back this time, sister. Uh, and then in 31, where it says, you know, Lord, may all your enemies die like Cicero. You're like, man, that's a little, that's a little harsh, you know? Um, may those who love you rise like the sun in all its power. And uh, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of strange uh, ending for me. You know, like the last thing you do is you give this power and this, this attribute to the sun, you know, which is it's kind of weird. It's kind of out of place for me. But it, it would have been normal at the time because there would have been tribes who, who would look at the sun as, as a god or a deity or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it, it rises, it's unstoppable, it's march across the, the, the sky every day. Uh, many, many old, you know, um, Old Testament time tribes would have told you that it was, you know, it was a wheel itself. It was a, it was a chariot wheel that God rides on. You can see many, uh, in archaeology, many different um, depictions of that. Um, but it would have definitely been worshipped uh, as a deity at that time. But the closing line of the chapter closes with God's gift. Uh, verse 31, and there was peace in the land for 40 years. And the land was tranquil for 40 years. I like that position. Um, now, for me, why did we not get that at the end of chapter 4? You know? I like to look at this like when Samuel's, when Samuel's placing this here. Um, he, he takes that and he scoops it down to the end. You know, that, I, I like that. Um, 
this, this is where the song goes, you know, this is the song of Deborah that we all sing, that, that my grandparents are saying, that their grandparents are saying. Everybody loves the song of Deborah. We're going to put it right here, and then we're going to close it with, um, you know, with, our, with our closing summary statement. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, we, we talked about 40 years ago, for, for that generation, um, it's another interpretation. Um, and then, of course, what, what happens? Why is it only 40 years? You know, we we'll find out next chapter. But um, there's a lot of theological, there's a lot of implications um, in, in chapter five. One of them is God is gracious, um, even though there's no evidence of repentance, which is a very, very unique thing that happens in this chapter. It, Israel is not repentant. They're, they're not. Oh, you step in for us, we're going to change. You know. Um, they, he responds to their cry, deliver us. You know? um, he provides this deliverance from King Jacob and Sisera. And he's gracious. He does this out, out of love. You know? He doesn't have to do this. God provides the victory. Um, you know, one thing here is that Barak, although he is the, he's the male figure, he's never shown as this you know, military hero. You know, um, He's always shown in this secondary role. Even at the very first line of chapter 5, it starts off with, this is the song of, of Deborah and, and Barak. Um, he's, given that, he's given that second secondary spot there, um, which you think typically would be you know, the role of verses. Um, he hesitates. He's seen as this weak-willed, uh, indecisive guy, you know, especially in the song. It calls him out like three times for being indecisive. Um, so when God brings Sisera out to the battle, it's not Barak's military strategy that defeats the army. It's God. Um, the Lord fought against the mighty warriors in verse 23. There's, there is no human victory. There is no grand strategy. Um, one of the things that, that Jeff had talked about last time, it was like a month ago, but last time we were in, is uh, he was talking about, right there where it talks about how they're confused, and they kind of turn on each other, which, which you know, uh, gives the victory. Uh, another thing which is very unique and, and, and it goes right along with that is in this um, I'm not going to find it now that we're talking the Kishon uh, in, verse, in verse 21 the Kishon River swept them away, that ancient torrent the Kishon um, so I, I'm not saying there's some kind of like flood or anything but I am saying it is this marshland where the Kishon's coming through and it definitely plays a role in their, in their demise you know, in their confusion, they're backed up against the river, um, whether they're in the marshlands or, or the water just you know, takes them. It says that ancient torrent. Um, but anyway, either way, this is not Barrack's move. This isn't uh, Deborah's move to military, you know, make this, make this strategy. Um, it's God's. This is done by God and in God's name. God's gracious. God provides the victory. And then women are strong and courageous. Uh, in this chapter and the previous, man, there is nothing more that we should be, uh, wow, this is this is something here, uh, the, the uniqueness of uh, the women in these chapters. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 are pictures of strong and courageous women that will um, set the tone for, for women, uh, Jewish women who are, who are singing these songs for the next generations and thousands of years, you know? Um, it's very unconventional for the time. Uh, 1300 BC is uh, it's the dawn of the Iron Age. It is very um, patriarch in their you know in their setting. Um, if women were to speak in the room, it would be at the man's um, you know uh, request or permission. Uh, it, it would not be the same way we are now. Uh, so so with that being said, these women they just they just take over. You know they are very. Um, out of their element, they're very, uh, very courageous. But um, you know, um, we have these daring. I like that word too. That's a good word. There's these daring women, uh, one going into the battle, leading the battle, and then the other one takes on the commander of the army one on one. Um, I, I mean, that's that's pretty awesome. Um, for the book of Judges, it's another example of the way uh, that God operates. If, if there's something. Overall, to take out of this, as we continue through the book of Judges, leading into chapter six, this is the way God operates. He um, 
he, he picks these extraordinary people who uh, would have never seen it in themselves. You know, uh, I'm not capable of such a thing. I can't. Uh, I can't be a military leader. I'm a woman. I can't be a speaker. Uh, I, I, I stumble at my words. I stutter. Um, I can't do this. I can't do that. And then God takes them and makes them do the exact opposite of what they are. Um, he's able to incorporate the free actions of human beings to fulfill his plan. He can use the most unbelievable people to, to achieve his plan. And, and Deborah herself is very remarkable. Um, in the entire Old Testament, she, she's a remarkable woman. In the entire Bible, honestly, she's an honorable figure. Uh, we kind of we talked about Othniel a little bit. He's he's shown with honor. And of course, Joshua was mentioned in chapter one, but she also has some honor. She's about the last person in the book that has it, um, but um, she's one of the most remarkable characters in the entire Old Testament. In the in the dark days of the Hebrews, when you think of the Book of Judges, I like to think of it like um, when you turn the brightness up on the screen because it is like it is the darkest times, the lowest point. We just continue to get worse and worse. She is a prophetess of God. She is this ray of light and hope um, in an era of weak men. God raises up a woman who's like a lightning rod um, and she asserts herself and his wrath. So in this time where there's this decline in the priesthood, uh, we'll see it before and we'll see it after her, um, she's this link between God and his people. Um, Really, as far as being a prophet, she, she's one of the first real, you know, you've got Moses, and then and, and Joshua's considered one of the sons of but like, when you, you get to her, like, she's really, you know, like, speaking on behalf of God, you know, telling them what's going to happen, she's, she's even judging, she's helping them, she's, she's a super important thing. Um, she sits <coughs> not back with Shiloh, which would have made more sense, but in, underneath this palm tree, um, between the towns, Receiving the pleas of the Israelites on behalf of God. Uh, she commissions Barak. She's God's representative. She accompanies Barak into the battle, representing God. For her to have lost in the battle would have been God losing in the battle. I think that's that's an important thing to see. Um, she is this she is this representation of him, uh, speaking on behalf of him. Um, and, and women have been inspired by her story for centuries. Uh, in our modern setting, I feel like women should be inspired by the story of, of um, Deborah. She doesn't displace men. She, she doesn't have anything to do with uh, gender roles or anything like that. Um, her gender doesn't disqualify her for the highest service for God at the highest level. God does not have a certain criteria um, when he chooses these people that he's going to choose. Besides, who may, maybe the most unpredictable uh, who, whoever he's going to choose to do his will is the exact person in the room you would never expect, you know. Um, and he would choose them just because to show you this is who I'm going to choose, you know. Um, I believe uh, that most of the called they never expect it. You know, I, I love that. They, they kind of have their, their life, their role, and just all of a sudden they're the street preacher and, and they can't stop talking to can't stop interacting because there's this fire in them that forces them to do this, you know? Um, now, some of them hesitate at first. Some of them are, are so unsure of themselves, there's just no way. You know, there's no way you're talking about me. Um, I like to look at it like you're just putting the most absolutely, you're out of your element you know, thing. Um, if uh, you were asked to take a test on something you know absolutely, we were going to take a test on the Chinese language this morning. Uh, we would all be like, well, we're not going to do well on that. You know, um, you know uh, something that is just actually not in our realm um, is exactly the realm that God places these people in. Um, they don't think of themselves as equipped or qualified. They're completely the opposite. Um, and so, um, with that, I, I, I do kind of like it. I'll show you something. I do kind of wonder if he chooses these people. Um, because they have this somewhat of a humbleness to them that they're willing to accept that role, you know, to some degree. But now some of them have to be walked through, and some of them, as we talk about next week, take a whole chapter to be convinced. But I do wonder if there is this, there is this, um, this humbleness, or even this void that they have in their lives. They kind of feel the whole time, 
there's something special I should be doing for God or for, or I know there's something I'm here for. You know, they, they had this special feeling. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty good question, you know. Um, one, one thing I like to say about Merrick, though, is that he, um, he never, he's never connected to God. You know, Merrick is super involved in the story. Um, he's, he's commissioned from Deborah by God, but like he, he doesn't talk about his views or his beliefs or his faith. Um, yet he is in God's plan, you know. Now, after this is over, does he have this lightning bolt moment where he realizes, man, I was working on behalf of God this whole time. I don't know, you know. So it, it leaves it open. Um, it's, good, it's a good question. You know, many people in the Bible, I often wonder, do they understand the role that they fill? You know, that's, that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Um, so, I don't know. But um, next week, we're going to start a whole new cycle. Favorite show that my favorite judge. Um, he's the most unconventional yet. He's the absolute most unguessable character. Um, if if we had you know every single one of the uh, the Jews who are alive at this point lined up, this is the last guy we're gonna pick. They're all lined up all across the, you know the valley, and then you got this one you know here hiding. Well, that guy over there, that's the one we're picking next week. So. Um, and in, in preparation for that, you can go on and read uh, chapter 6. Um, I think it's 1 through 32 is that opening story we're going to focus on next week. Um, he's actually three chapters long. So um, the story of Gideon, he is, uh, he is uh, an absolutely unique character uh, in the same way that Deborah is. But um, anybody got any uh, any thoughts on, uh, on Deborah in this chapter? Or like, uh, you know, one thing that I do want to point out real quick is the style in which we, we have this whole chapter. It's very unique, especially to the book of Judges. Where you've got the story, you've got chapter 4, which walks us through it, and then you've got chapter 5, where we've got this song. Um, and for me, it is, it is supposed to inspire us. It's supposed to entertain us. It's supposed to be something that we see. Uh, I looked up um, on the internet. Uh, of course, you never want to look up great things on the internet. I looked up on the internet, which I'm going to pull up here while we're talking. Um, somebody's singing um, Chapter 5, you know? Oh. And I found this hilarious video. <laughs> anyway, uh, I found a couple of Jewish guys who, uh, who sing it, and they, and they do good, you know? But um, <laughs> this should be good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is so violent. I just find it hilarious. All right, moving on.
Be my mom tomorrow, uh, Tuesday. She's having back surgery. Pray for me that I'm getting more familiar with my life right now. I just want to come for you this time just thank you, Lord, for the day. Lord, just thank you, Lord, for the privilege we get to come and worship you. Lord, just pray that you'd be with each prayer request we heard today, Lord. You know the needs, you know the situation. Lord, we know that you're in control, Lord, and that's the most important part of it, Lord. Just, we, Lord, we're going to trust you in all that we, all that's going on, Lord. We're just going to believe that you're going to heal in the way that's pleasing to you. Lord, I just thank you for this group. Lord, I thank you for our church. I just pray that you just bless us as we go to worship, Lord. That, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would give you all the worship that you deserve today, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would see lives changed. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, be ready. We're going to sing the song. You pull that guitar out, right? we're going. Oh. <laughs> he fell, he fell, he fell. <laughs> 